I can feel my saturation leaving me slowly. <laughs> what a way to, what a beautiful and, and optimistic way to start a brand new album for 21 Pilots, a wonderfully transparent, creative duo featuring, of course, Tyler Joseph, one of my favorite people to talk to on the planet when it comes to music, art, craft, and all that goes into it. What's up, man? Good to see you. Thanks for having me, man. Thanks for coming back with, you know, such a wonderful creative record, 11 songs, so tight. It's just like choo -choo, everything you need to say right there in between these two pillars. I could tell because you're a, a very aesthetically driven human being that that was all very deliberate. Everything is very deliberate. Why 11 songs? Why the time frame? How did it work out? I would say for this record, uh, you know, usually when you're writing records, you have an idea of which song you're writing. Like this is a number three song or this is towards the back end, like to bring it home, or this is the last song. Uh, on this one, I, I knew that the song Good Day was going to be the first song on the record, and I knew the song Redecorate was going to be the last one. But everything inside there was very, it was more liquid and available to be moved around as the creation process happened. And so, um, and it's supposed to feel like that. It's supposed to feel like a, you know, a flow of creativity rather than something very chronological which I, in the past I've done some more chronological stuff. So, And yet it feels very compact. And, and like I said, as focused as any other record you've ever, ever made. I suppose for the first time, you were able to surprise yourself with that by going into that selection process and that ordering process with the same sense of kind of wonder as we get when we hear it for the first time because you haven't been putting all those things in place as you've been going along. You must have surprised yourself with this album a bit. On the last record on Trench, I got caught up in the idea of trying to reinvent a wheel when it comes to song structure and different approaches in the songwriting style and the, the lyrics and um, how abstract I could get. And, um, and I enjoyed stretching myself in that way. On this record, I really wanted to bring it back to the craft of songwriting, to stay within the parameters. I, I view it as a a picture frame. You know, what, how, what can I what can I put in the into that picture frame? What can what kind of painting can I do? It's it's a short record. It's like a little over thirty some minutes long. You know, and it, for you know to put a year of your life into something and then you have thirty minutes to show for it is is a pretty um, humbling <laughs> experience. Quality, <laughs> not quantity, Tyler. You know that. How did you know this was going to be the first song? Then how did you what what made it so? It was so different than every other first song that I've ever done. I've kind of developed this formula for how live shows should feel. And I think that because the live experience is so tied to the creation process of the record, <clears throat> I've always naturally written a first song that felt like would also be the first song for a live experience. And, you know, it's got the low rumble. It's got the, you know, the ominous, you know, we're about to take over your life type of thing. And this was um, a completely different first. This is like a... I wanted it to feel like I was turning lights on. I was like, I was, I walked into a warehouse and I, you know, it was everything, you know, it was kicking on section by section. And that's what this song felt like. And then all of a sudden to go into this piano riff, it, it just was reminiscent of how maybe some older concerts would have started rather than what, what we do today with the big scrim that falls down and the, the low rumble and the big boom. Like it's, it's a little more walk out on stage, turn the lights on and smile was kind of the, the vibe for this first song. And so is that the saturation that you refer to to some degree in the opening line, which is always a very important moment on any album, the idea of oversaturating yourself with your, own, with your own creativity or your own, like you say, parameters or desire to reinvent the wheel? Well, I knew that this record was going to be very colorful. And so the idea of saturation was one that I was going to compensate for in the branding. I was going to make it very colorful. We're going to have just a flow of different colors coming in and the branding was going to be very bright and exciting. And then lyrically talking about desaturation, this song is, a, is about getting to a place where if I were to lose everything, if I lost my wife and my kid, how would I in the first week react to that? And I think that what I would be is overly positive. Like it's fine. There's a reason for everything. I'm okay. I even like put a specific time on it. Like I feel like a lot of stuff, anytime you go on vacation, something weird might happen. Like someone comes down with some um, weird sickness 
I've had a couple of weird things happen to my family while on vacation. And I don't know if that's just me or if other people have experienced that. Maybe you're in a new place, you don't have your rhythm normal and something happens. But the idea of, I was trying to put myself there, like how would I react to some terrible thing happening over you know, a vacation that we were all on? And it was a really dark place to go. And the fact that this song is, that's what it's talking about, is trying wow. to wrestle with, you know, in the lyric to the chorus is talking about how, um, would you say you depend on the weather? Because my sunshine is a buzz and a light. I'll be singing out. I know it's hard to believe me, but it's a good day. But, you know, I really do feel like the, the vice of drinking and smoking, like I would just be like, no lid, let's go, go all in. I would just search for anything I could to compensate for that sorrow. I don't know. It's a it's a really um, powerful thing to try to write about something, you know, almost projecting something that hopefully never happens. As a fellow husband and father, that is the worst thing I can imagine. That is my number one fear worst. Number is, one, yeah. is, is losing my family. That'll send me into a spiral. And so I know you're a courageous writer. It's one of the things I love about your music is that you go there. But that is like a whole other level for you to go and, and, and approach that and then to dress it up in these colorful clothes. I feel like this song, Good Day, not only is it a great song to start a record, but it's also, I would imagine that there is a spectrum of grief. I, people talk about the stages of grief. And I would imagine that one of those stages would feel a little bit like this song where you're just convincing yourself. You're, I mean, you're talking to someone Absolute purely denial. in denial. Absolute denial. Yeah. I wanted to try to put a timestamp on what that period of, of grief might feel like. You've spent the last year plus, like the rest of us, in your situation, and everyone's micro is whatever the situation they found themselves in on day one of quarantine, that's kind of it. And depending on where you are on the spectrum of wealth and health and all those things that suddenly come into focus will depend on how much you can change your, your and, and alter your scenario, right? Be spontaneous, be malleable in an otherwise very unmalleable scenario. You found yourself at home. A father and a father-to-be and a husband and all of that stuff going on at the same time that you were starting to collect your creative thoughts. What was that process like for you looking back on it now, now that we can? It was crazy. I have this argument with my father about, he says, the best workers are dads. You know, there's something about when you become a dad, you become a harder worker, you become a, a better worker. The best the hunter gatherer mentality is what they refer to it as, right? I guess. And actually, I've always argued with him like, well, I mean, you can't argue, dad, that it, when you become a dad, you have less time to work on that thing that you're working on. So you think that you become a better worker. And this, of, of course, this is like pre me being a father. I would always argue, inevitably, dad, when you have a kid, time gets taken away from what you're able to pour into your craft. There's no way that you are a better worker from becoming a father. And so I, I kind of stood, I mean, not that I didn't want to be a dad, but for him to be so blatant and so steadfast in believing that when you become a dad, when you become a parent, you become a better worker. I just didn't understand how you could balance the time it takes to be a parent, uh, and it's going to be extracted from the time that you would pour into that craft. Then something hit me during this making of the record. How to justify the philosophy that you become a better worker when you become a dad. I realized that uh, if I were to go into a parallel universe and we were to split off and the musician, you know, artist, songwriter Tyler would continue down this path where he wasn't a family guy and he just kept on you know, creating every single day and then or the path that I'm on right now, which is I'm splitting my time between what it is I do for a living, it, you know, working on songs, but also being, you know, a part of a family. I realized that what would happen is, yes, right in the front end of that timeline on the, you know, single guy, he would probably chug away and get a lot done. But I know that inevitably I would burn out. I would hit a wall where I just don't, what's the point? If I don't have, I don't, if I'm not able to answer the question, what is the point of me working on these songs? What, are the, what is the point of me creating? And I don't have anything to point back to that is the point. I would just, I would burn out, I know. And so this other parallel, the universe I'm living right now, where 
I may not be able to chug and, and grind as hard as I want because I have to split my time up. I believe that there's actually a longevity to that career because I'm able to stop. And anytime I'm a slightly burnt out, I turn around and I know why I'm doing what I'm doing. So in a sense, my dad was right all the time. And, uh, and he always tends to be. So I figured that out this year. I figured that out that my dad's smart. Did you feel prepared to become a father? Was it something that when you became a dad, that those instincts came naturally to you? Or did you have to spend some time working on yourself in order to identify what, how you could play the best possible role in your, in your children's future? You know, I'm a, I'm a father of one. She's you know, a little over one years old. And one of the first things you have to do as a parent before you're even, you even become a parent is you have to name that kid. And talk about the beginning of heavy decisions. <laughs> you know, like that's just the cusp of decisions you have to make as a parent. That's, the, that's number one. And so when someone is thinking about becoming a parent, becoming a mom or a dad um, or a guardian or, or whatever, and, and you start to feel like, oh my gosh, there's all these decisions that need to be made. And I don't know how I would ever be able to rise to that occasion. Something happens when it happens. And what I mean by that is, you know, I, I knew I wanted to name my daughter Rosie. But I was up until she was born, I was, I was just so like, is that the right name? Is she going to like that name? Is she going to become that name? Is the name going to become her? You know, how is it going to impact her, her decisions? You know, people have this philosophy that your name can actually change the course of, you know, your, your future. Um, and, you know, just that being the number one decision out of a infinite amount of decisions I have to make as a father, I was so worked up about, did I name her right? And then she was born and something clicked where it was like, oh, that's Rosie. Yeah. That, that's her. It, it just, that was, an, that, you know, looking back, I remember that it was a tough decision. But now that the name is connected to the face, it's like they, it, it, there was no other there was no other option. And a lot of the decisions that I make as a parent that my wife and I make, we realize leading up to decision moment is the most stressful moment. But when the decision is made and you make a certain um, turn with them, you realize, oh, that's just who they are. That's who it always was going to be. And it really starts to take the pressure out of becoming a parent. And so, yeah, leading up to being a parent, it is the, it is the most constricting, stressful thing. But when it happens, something clicks. I hear you when you talk about the leading up to the decision and then that sense of kind of com completion and ultimate relief once the decision is made. Okay, now we get on with living with the decision, you know? And I sort of wonder whether or not that realization at a pivotal moment in anyone's life when they become a parent prepared you to handle the decision-making process differently as a creative because I know that you take each decision when it comes to 21 Pilots, very seriously. So in going into making this record, was there a correlation between making a decision as a parent and ultimately moving forward as a creative? It's a good question. I think that one of the greatest strengths that you can have as not just a songwriter, but a, a performer and a musician is the ability to fast forward and put yourself project yourself onto uh, something that's going to happen. The ability to just calm yourself and picture yourself there. So the question of, you know, as something as simple as, wait, that song, we shouldn't put it next to that song in the set list because I just ran around for three minutes and then you want, you know, then I shouldn't be just sitting down and calmly hitting those vocal notes because I'm going to be out of breath. You know, so instead of realizing that the hard way, you put yourself there and then you start working backwards. What are the, what are lessons that I'm going to learn having done this? And so having that being something that I'm always focusing on, you know, whether it's, be, you know, mostly because of concerts, you know, trying to project and put yourself there before you get up on stage, doing the rehearsal before, you know, in your head, even um, as a parent, I've been thinking about being a parent for a long time. You know, I've, I've been thinking about how I want to tell her, I think she's pretty, even at a very young age. It's like, I know I want to tell her that all the time. To answer your question, as a, as a creative, I've always worked on trying to, trying to see something happen before it happens. And that, I guess, in a sense, has helped me be a dad 
you know, I took a video of her. She's starting to walk around. And um, she walked up to me and she said something and I'm videoing on my phone, you know. And and then I do the first thing. I, I, I've never done this before. I play the video for her. You can see her connect like, that's me. And she's looking at it. She's very excited about it. But then this weird, like, concern look looks, you know, is on her face. Like, she doesn't understand why that's her. And maybe, and all of a sudden it hit me like one day she might not like what she looks like. And I'm going to have to help her realize that she's beautiful and she's, she's uh, amazing. And I, I want to start that now, even when she's one years old, you know? And so you start to look, you start to project things out and try to, what are some lessons I'm going to learn and how can I start preparing for them right now? And that's one that it hit me just the other day. 